at an affordable cost. Cover the expenses as well as free education and training. This is based on an asynchronous online delivery mode that helps to bridge the time zone difference and thereby provides a platform for learning opportunities to busy clinicians. The World Kidneys teaching and training programs are delivered by experienced clinicians from various reputable national and international centers to enhance exposure to a broad spectrum of clinical experience. The educational modalities include online lectures, video conferencing for interactive sessions, case-based discussions, critical appraisal of scientific papers, problem-solving exercises, and face-to-face -face workshops. The World Kidney Academy programs are accredited by the American Association of Continuing Medical Education or the European Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education. The World Kidney Academy, committed to education and training. The meeting is starting in one minute. Welcome to the World Kidney Academy. The World Kidney Academy aims to provide high quality and evidence-based clinical education at an affordable cost to cover the expenses as well as free education and training. This is based on an asynchronous online delivery mode that helps to bridge the time zone difference and thereby provides a platform for learning opportunities to busy clinicians. The World Kidneys teaching and training programs are delivered by experienced clinicians from various reputable national and international centers to enhance exposure to a broad spectrum of clinical experience. The educational modalities include online lectures, video conferencing for interactive sessions, case-based discussions, critical appraisal of scientific papers, problem-solving exercises, and face-to-face -face workshops. The World Kidney Academy programs are accredited by the American Association of Continuing Medical Education or the European Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education. The World Kidney Academy, committed to education and training. Now, oh, welcome everyone. I'm very glad to see all of you today in our osteoporosis webinar. The World Kidney Academy is non-commercial uh, academy that is uh, interested in long and short term high quality education. It offers several programs, not only limited to the kidney, but also to other aspects of the medicine and transplantation. We are uh, running several fellowship programs and diplomas and uh, um, graduate certificate programs. We have fellowship in cal clinical transplantation, fellowship in scientific writing and patient handling, and CKD MBD graduate certificate program. We have GN fellowship disease donor transplantation workshop. And for 2024, we are planning to add another three long-term uh, will uh, structured uh, fellowship. And on top, we are also planning to start another uh, four short-term mini module uh, educational program. Uh, welcome everyone. And uh, uh, we are glad to have Dr. Ahmed Halawa with us, the president of the academy, and he's going to welcome all of you. Please go ahead, Dr. Halawa. You are muted. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Dr. Salawa. I uh, will be able uh, to meet and um, um, welcome all of our guests. Welcome, uh, Professor Yasser Al Medani uh, from England. Uh, welcome, uh, Professor Basil Masri from. Jordan, and I welcome all of you, um, you know, the participants and the attendees. And I think we can start with uh, the quiz 
Dr. Shaima Shabka will start by the quiz. Then after that, we'll have Dr. Yasser Medani lecture. So the quiz will be just for five minutes. Dr. Yasser Medani lecture will be for 20 minutes followed by discussion. And uh, Dr. Basil Masri will moderate the discussion with um, Professor Amani Musa and uh, uh, Professor Rasha Samir. And uh, then this will be followed by case presentation and uh, case discussion. Uh, then the second lecture will be presented by Dr. Fatma Hamdi from uh, Mansoura University, followed by another case presentation by Dr. Mohammed Mamdouh. Then Dr. Shaima will give us the answers for the quiz and the explanation. Uh, welcome uh, everyone. Uh, I wanted to draw your attention to the link uh, I have yeah. just uh, shared in the chat box. Uh, it's the link for our quiz for today. Please uh, share your answers to this uh, Google form. Which is number one? Frax is a tool to estimate the risk of Structures using osteoporosis risk factors. Which of the following is considered an osteoporosis risk factor but not included in the FRAX? Paternal hip fracture, chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease, current smoking, or excessive alcohol intake. Question number two. FRAX Plus was developed to overcome the limitations of FRAX. Among the modifications of REX was the incorporation of an additional comorbidity. It is rheumatoid arthritis, cerebrovascular diseases, cardiovascular diseases, type 1 diabetes mellitus, or type 2 diabetes mellitus. Question number three. Regarding BMD measurement, which statement is correct? Z-score compares the patient's BMD to the young adult reference population. T-score compares the patient's BMD to an age-matched population. Osteophytes and vascular calcifications may interfere with BMD measurements by DEXA scan. Vascular calcifications interfere with BMD measurements by QCT, or it is a qualitative rather than a quantitative test. Question number four. All of the following statements regarding the secondary osteoporosis due to rheumatoid arthritis are correct except inflammatory cytokines have a major role in pathogenesis, bone fragility result from both low BMD and bone quality, hip fractures are the most frequent type of osteoporotic fractures, higher disease activity is associated with bone loss and osteoporosis, High but not low doses of glucocorticoids appear to increase the risk of osteoporosis. Question number five. All of the following statements are true regarding bone turnover markers except P1 and B is recommended for clinical use as a bone formation biomarker. CTX1 is recommended for clinical use as a bone resorption biomarker. PTMs increase for several months after fractures. PTMs are widely used for diagnosis of osteoporosis. Very high PTMs level suggest secondary causes of high turnover as bone meds and multiple myeloma. Question number six. Which one of the following drugs used to treat osteoporosis is primarily a sclerostin inhibitor? Is it raloxifen? or denuzumab, rizitronit, romuzumab, or odensity. Question number seven. The cutoff T-score for diagnosing osteoporosis in patients receiving a glucocorticoid is minus 2.5, minus 1.5, minus 3, minus 3.5, or minus 1. The last question. Several medications administered in autoimmune disorders could lead to decreased BMD. All of the following can lead to this disorder except mesotrexate, cyclophosphamide, etanercept, 
gonadotropin releasing hormone or heparin. Thank you. Please share your answer in the uh, Google form in the chat box. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shaima, for uh, this uh, uh, nice, intellectual, thoughtful uh, quizzes. And uh, please, you have uh, almost uh, uh, more than one and a half hour to answer and uh, uh, share with your comments. And uh, Dr. Shema is going by the end of the meeting to share the correct answer with all of us. And now we have uh, uh, Professor Ahmed Halawa, uh, who is interested to welcome all of you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Am, and thank you everybody for organizing this uh, interesting webinar and also the topic of osteoporosis and metabolic disorders. I think all of us have osteoporosis and we have some metabolic disorders. <laughs> I think we'll benefit from this webinar ourselves because most of us have some problems, back, legs, joints, whatever. Also, Patients, I'm sure we deal with a chronic renal failure patient in addition to other subspecialties as well. Osteoporosis and metabolic disorders is integral part of the management of the patients as well. Um, again, I would like to thank the organizing committee, Professor Amba and his colleagues, from the, uh, Dr. Mamdou as well for the hard effort he put to generate this program. And uh, just, I would like to reiterate what Professor Amra said. The World Kidney Academy is a non-profit organization aiming at delivering high education, high quality education, at affordable cost, just to cover the expenses, to cover the technology, to cover the administration. We are, we welcome any ideas who can help our patients, our colleagues, seniors, or juniors as well. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to uh, welcome you and say hello. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Halawa. Now, Dr. Um, uh, Masri is going to introduce Dr. Yasser Medan. Assalamu uh, alaikum, Jamian. First, thank you for the World uh, Academy, uh, Professor Ram, to uh, invite me to to moderate uh, the lecture of this, of this session of Professor, my friend, Professor Yasser al uh, who is very well known professor uh, in Canterbury Christ Church University, senior clinical lecturer at King's College London and Secretary General of Pan-Arab Osteoporosis Society and also head of the Egyptian Academy of Bone Health. Uh, has several publications in the field of bone and uh, muscles uh, health. Uh, I'm so glad to uh, and give the floor to Professor uh, Bidani, please. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Basil. So thank you, Professor Amr, Ahmed Halawa, uh, Dr. Abdelbari. Uh, happy to be with you today and happy to uh, share <clears throat> our experience uh, in bone health with the uh, World uh, Kidney Academy. Thanks, Shaima, for that quiz. It was interesting, and I think it's motivating and brainstorming before we start the uh, presentation. My presentation today will be, uh, I can stratify it into two halves. First half, I'll speak about the new developments in the field of osteoporosis and how we moved from the diagnostic into interventional. Uh, osteoporosis management, and the second half I'll speak about FRAGS and the recent developments uh, that happened to FRAGS, and I'll share with you live uh, uh, some footage from the FRAGS website. Uh, perhaps the first question actually uh, we would like to ask is, on what base do you diagnose osteoporosis? Is it based on BMD, history fracture, fracture risk, or risk factors. Actually, because we, we cannot have voting now, most of the answers were based on BMD as a diagnostic test for osteoporosis. Then the second question is, on what base do you treat osteoporosis? Is again BMD, history fracture, fracture risk, a risk factor, and in uh, previous uh, uh, settings or uh, meetings, most of the people also relied on BMD as the main uh, 
uh, factor to diagnose and to treat osteoporosis. Meaning that if the patient has osteoporosis, he receives treatment. If the patient has osteopenia or normal uh, BMD, then we don't give treatment. We may advise calcium, vitamin D, exercise, whatever. However, we have noted a gap in the management of the patient who are at increased risk of fracture. This gap is present everywhere in Europe. Of course, it varies from country to another, but it can reach up to 90%, like countries like Germany. And it can be very low in countries like Ireland or Sweden. Uh, locally in our region, in the Middle East, Egypt, for example, we had 92% gap between patients who were eligible for osteoporosis fracture and who developed osteoporotic fractures. However, they haven't received any treatment. Okay, so why do we have this gap? One of them was lack of awareness of increased fracture risk among the healthcare professionals themselves. So we have witnessed that several times with our colleagues from orthopedic surgery who believe that by fixing the fracture, we've done everything we can and we don't need to do anything anymore. The second explanation was fault with the definition of osteoporosis and time to rethink. So as we said, we just we were relying on BMD as the main factor. Third, is it the time to separate now diagnosis from treatment thresholds in osteoporosis? Lastly, and this again, another important issue is lack of patient awareness. Patient education is very poor, especially <clears throat> in our countries. <clears throat> and even in the developed countries, many patients who got fracture, they say, well, I just tripped. And that's it. This, this was an uh, um, uh, unintended uh, accident. And uh, that's how I got the, accident, and that, the fracture. And that's all. Looking at the definition of osteoporosis, I'm quoting here the WHO definition, which is a systematic disease, a systemic disease, a systemic skeletal disease characterized by low bone mass, microarchitecture deterioration of bone tissue with a consequent increase of bone fragility and susceptibility to fracture. This is the definition of uh, osteoporosis as identified by uh, WHO. And based on that, WHO identified T-score of minus 2.5 as a diagnostic test for osteoporosis. Then we got another definition of established osteoporosis, which is the same BMD minus 2.5 plus having a history of a past history of fragility. The question now is whether the definition of osteoporosis should automatically also define the interventional threshold, meaning that if I have a patient with T-score minus 2.5, that's the interventional threshold, I will start treatment. If my patient does not have minus 2.5, I would say no need to treat. Well, we make osteoporosis, put sim uh, osteoporosis similar to other disease, systemic diseases like hypertension, like diabetes, like hypercholesterolemia. In all these cases, we have a definition of the condition. There is significant and fixed points of risk factors. And these risk factors, like high blood pressure or diabetes, are associated with risk of outcomes. Like, for example, hypertension is usually associated with stroke, diabetes, neuropathy, hyperlipidemia, myocardial infarction. So when I say that I will use past history, the fracture risk as a diagnostic threshold, we are saying now that this is important. And in 2014, actually, there, there were trials of including fracture risk as a, a risk factor for uh, intervention, meaning to start treatment. And at that time, the diagnosis of osteoporosis should be widened, and that was a suggestion 2014, to include postmenopausal women and men aged 50 years old with one or more of this, either hip fracture, other low trauma fracture in the presence of osteopenia, those with high fracture risk calculated by FRAX. And that was the first time we hear FRAX as a diagnostic criteria and uh, uh, for uh, uh, osteoporosis uh, patients who require treatment, although FRAX has been there since nearly 2010. In addition, uh, those who meet that WHO definition. The, notion of the having past history of fracture was also, as a diagnostic criteria, was also proposed in 2020, 2020, meaning that the presence of a past history of fracture is an important factor for us when we consider any form of therapy for the patient. 
So why we said that? Because actually, if we fail to identify that there is a fracture risk or a risk of fracture happening with this patient in a patient who already developed fracture, we have failed. It's exactly like we are waiting uh, to say the patient got stroke because he has hypertension. We haven't treated the hypertension. So it's too late to say that the patient has hypertension if he developed stroke, or too late to say that the patient has hyperlipidemia after he developed myocardial infarction. Actually, I should see the risk factors like hyperlipidemia or diabetes or hypertension and work on them to prevent the occurrence of the high risk outcome in every condition. And the same is applicable to osteoporosis. I should work to prevent the fracture rather than to wait for a fracture to happen. On that base, started to have interventional threshold. So now the first time to say, okay, we can diagnose with osteopenia or osteoporosis, but there is a new concept of having high fracture risk. So even if my patient had osteopenia and high fracture risk, there is a consideration of interventional threshold. This was the outcome of a NORA, NORA study. NORA study was published uh, nearly 10 years ago. Very interesting study. They looked at 250,000 patients who developed postproposal women who developed uh, uh, fragility fractures. They found that 48% of the patients who developed fragility fractures were osteopenia range and not osteoporosis, meaning that we are nearly missing half of our patients in when we speak about uh, osteoporosis management. So let us see now when we add uh, uh, risk factors, for example. So this is when we look at the risk of the fracture, 10 year probability of uh, fracture in a patient versus his BMD. And as we can see here, this is minus two, and this minus 2.5 and minus three, and that's the threshold through which we manage. Okay, let's have a look at this. If I added having high history of uh, past history of fracture, you can see that it's the same T-score, but I have higher risk even with minus two. So add having a past history of fracture is important to legitimate the treatment, even with T-score in the osteopenia range. If we added another factor like steroids, and as we can see here, it goes higher. So even in the osteopenia range, you can see the 10 year probability of osteoporosis fracture approaching 40%. And this goes even higher and higher if there is a family history of a fracture. So actually these risk factors are important when we speak about assessment of 10 year probability of major osteoporosis fracture. Based on that, we developed the FRAX, or the FRAX was developed. There was one main point that raised at that time. Does osteoporosis therapy work or not in patients with osteopenia, patients who did not meet the BMD definition of osteoporosis, which is T-score minus 2.5? Actually, this is not right. Patients can be treated even in the osteopenia range and they can add to the pulmonary test. So when we speak about BMD threshold versus the new interventional threshold, including the fracture risk, we find that there has been a big difference. <laughs> because the future skeletal failure is more likely to occur in patients who already sustained a, a, a skeletal failure before, like fracture. Based on that, the uh, United States, uh, NOF, National Osteoporosis Foundation, recommended BMD in all women uh, uh, age 65 and treat if their BMD is minus 2.5. Also, they suggested treatment recommended for women with a prior history of hip or spine fracture. In Europe, they did not recommend a routine screening, but they recommend that all patients all postmenopausal women with fragility fracture should be considered for eligible, should be considered eligible for that. So the use of the prior fracture as an interventional threshold has, is aligned with the management of other chronic diseases. For example, disease-related outcomes mandate the consideration and use of intervention. Okay, so may, somebody may ask me, what is the intervention in osteoporosis that can work 
as an interventional threshold and reduce the risk of killing the fracture. This is the fracture liaison service. Fracture liaison service has been there for 10 years and it has shown a very good efficacy to improve access to better management and treatment, leading to a reduction in uh, future fracture. So using the FRAX is important. And when we developed the FRAX, it was developed and having either cut off points like 20% for a 10 year probability of major spross fracture or 3% for hip fracture. And uh, uh, this, you can have it in addition to uh, BMD or not, it's up to you. But having the 10 year probability of major spross fracture by itself can be used can be used as a screening tool amongst patients through which you can identify who would be candidate for further assessment. And based on that, we, we have now uh, normal, which is here in the green, and in the uh, yellow here is intermediate, then this is the orange, then the yellow is high, and the red is very high uh, risk of fraction. Let me just go through the I will encourage you to use actually the Frax Plus because this is actually the new uh, format that will be used to for assessment of Frax. And later on, what we will what, what we will hear now from the lecture is the Frax Plus. Um, uh, the Frax, actually, as we can see here, it has been used by 41 million from 2011. If we clicked on click uh, calculate now, you will have the same questionnaire. Can you see the sorry, screen? Sorry for interruption, Professor. Yes. <clears throat> We're still seeing your PowerPoint. Oh, okay. One second. Is that okay now? Yes. Okay. So um, this is the FRAX. So I'll just I'll go back again. This is the the new FRAX Plus uh, page. It's just you put fraxplus.org, and you will find here. Uh, uh, welcome to FRAX. This is the new home for the FRAX. So the old home. I think it will be used, but the update will be here, and they are offering a lot of more options, including even access to your uh, to the assessment done in your area as a whole. So they will give you uh, some access to your data. That's the plan from the Frax Plus. So if you press calculate, then you will have the uh, country. You can select your country from here, and uh, you can put a uh, uh, continent. You can put the patient ID, and then you have here the questionnaire itself. And what I do personally is I, I ask a patient to complete self-reporting questionnaire, ask about the age. As you can see here, it covers between 40 to 90 years old, or you put date of birth, and then sex, weight, height, previous fracture, uh, parent fracture, hip, uh, current smoking, glucorticoid, rheumatoid, and secondary osteoporosis. And then you can calculate the uh, fracture risk then if you have, you can calculate fracture risk without uh, neck, femoral neck BMD. If you have femoral neck BMD, you can add it and then calculate again. I'll come back to this later on. I'll do a new share again. So after developing the FRAX, there was a very something interesting note that attracted the attention that not all the countries have the same higher risk of fracture. So as we can see here on the right, that Denmark is the highest all over the world, followed by Sweden, uh, Austria, and UK. You can see even significant difference between UK and Denmark. Then it goes gradually down even that's why there was interest to check for what we call country specific fracks and even when we looked at the fracture risks the cut off points that can be used not all the time it's 20 percent 
it can be 10%, it can be 15%. So that's why every country should have its own cutoff points for the higher fracture risk for osteoporosis. Unfortunately, there are several countries who just took the 20% and the 3%, 20% major osteoporosis fracture, 3% hip fracture, just based that this was developed in America. When we looked actually uh, uh, comparing the Middle East, we looked at Egypt versus Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Morocco, and there were significant differences between the different countries in terms of uh, uh, the incidence of hip fracture. For example, I look here at uh, uh, 75 years old, three, in the men 393, 761, in uh, Qatar, 560, six, nearly 700. Then 363, 433 in Saudi Arabia, and Morocco, 400 and 300. I was interested to compare our uh, FRAX, for example, the performance of the instance of hip fracture with other countries in the Eastern Mediterranean. And it was more or less matching uh, uh, between Egypt, uh, Malta, and Greece. However, gradually we found that there has been what they called teasing problems of FRACs. So as I said, it was developed 2010. This was published in 2020, speaking about the defects of the FRACs and why we have this. And based on that, actually, I, I uh, published a paper about do we need to readjust FRACs or develop a new FRACs? And there was a long list of adjustment to the FRACs. First one is the not only past history fracture, but also how recent is the fracture. Number two is the glucorticoid dose, the dose of steroids used. Not all the patients are the same. Not all the steroid doses has the same negative impact of the, of, on, the, on the bones. Data on the uh, lumbar spine, BMD, trabecular bone score, hip axis length, folds history, and that was almost criticized for fracs. It does not include folds immigration status, type 2 diabetes, androgen depletion and hormone antagonist therapy, and lastly, chronic kidney disease. These are all risk factors that haven't been included in FRACs and has been criticized for missing these important risk factors. That's why FRACs Plus was developed. And FRACs Plus, <coughs> as we can see here, included the recency of fracture. So after you calculate the FRACs, you can go down to FRAX Plus and click on every one of them and it will give you the answers. How recent is the fracture, hip exposure, uh, high exposure to oral glucocorticoids, type 2 diabetes, concurrent data on lumbar spine, BMD, information on the trabecular bone score, folds history, and hip axis lens. So these are the new additions to the FRAX, which is called now FRAX Plus, and you can calculate using the FRAX website there. Uh, most of the people all over the world I have credit for five patients. Then after that, they have to set an account and see how they proceed with the condition. Let me just go through the evidence we have on what base we spoke about recency of fracture. So, for example, if you look at the 10-year probability of a patient with uh, a fracture in adult life, you can say that they are higher by 11.7. If this fracture was recent, meaning that happened in the past two years, you can go up to 29%. Similarly, in the patient with 60 years old, 19% jump into 36, 27, 41. So you can see how important is the recent vertebral fracture or any recent fracture can impact on the 10 year probability of major osteoporosis. The same with the steroid dose. So if those lose then 2.5, is different from medium 2.5 to 7.5 and high more than 7.5. And in such case, actually, it was suggested to multiply the uh, FRAX uh, by any of these factors subject to the steroid dose. And this is different between major spruce fracture and hip fracture. Actually, this is now will be done automatically for you using the FRAX plus. TBS is important because TBS, we found actually the new softwares that assess TBS can show you whether the patient's TBS has responded well to therapy. Some people now okay, may ask, what's the aim of my treatment? What's the target? Shall I increase the BMD and preserve the bone microarchitecture or increase the BMD and improve the bone microarchitecture? 
So this is very important, and we can now, using the new softwares, to assess for that TBS and monitor it. Uh, here is the uh, hip length, and this will be calculated using softwares about the distance from the base of the greater trochanter, as we can see here, to the inner pelvic area. Just to conclude my presentation for the time, there is little evidence that change in the diagnostic criteria for osteoporosis alone would improve management for these patients. The WHO BMD based will remain, it will not go, but it will be important to assess the incidence and the prevalence of osteoporosis in certain countries. And it will be important to compare between different countries. It's exactly will be used similar to myocardial infarction and stroke, for example. BMD alone, as we said, is less sensitive than risk assessment algorithm like FRAX, for example, which is important to assess the patient risk factor. And when we speak about interventional threshold, there is a need for a parallel diagnosis of BMD defined osteoporosis and a, a assessment of the fracture risk so that we can calculate and consider patient quality. Increasing evidence of the implementation of fracture liaison service through campaigns like capture the fracture can improve access to better management and treatment leading to reduction in future. Uh, just lastly, all what I want to say is the BMD based definition. It will be there, it will not go, but we have to consider the fracture risk also uh, in our assessment for every patient. And thank you. Thank you, Professor Yasser Limidani, for your uh, informative and really great uh, presentation about FRAX and FRAX plus the risk factors, how, when to intervene, and so. So, uh, uh, just uh, if we have the question in the chat, I think the question should be in the chat. We have uh, we have two or three questions from uh, Doctor Abdul Hamid. The first one is value of repeating DEXA scan and when to, re when to repeat and if that can change management of the plan. Okay. So that's a good question because this is the treatment to target. What is the target of our therapy? As we said here, number one, we need to improve bone mineral density. Number two, we need to prevent fractures. Number three, if we can improve the bone microarchitecture. So the target, if you are looking at BMD, you are looking any uh, to improve the bone density to somewhere between minus 1.5 to minus 2. Improvement to uh, BMD in this range will be good. So repeating DEXA scan is advisable. When can you repeat? Not less than two years. To, to, uh, to, when you start treatment, apart from romosocimab, we'll speak about this separately, all the other treatments you should reassess in two years' time and then you may consider in three years' time after that. Romosocimab, because it, uh, it is given for one year course, then you will assess after one year. Maybe glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis also should repeat uh, less frequently one year after, as you. Well, it can be, yeah, it can be. And the second important thing, as I said, a criteria of failure is not just uh, if the BMD state remained the same. But no fracture, that's still a good response and continue your treatment. I think there's a uh, question about exercise, yes? Yes. What about exercise uh, for osteoporosis patients? That's a good question also. Uh, let me give you the experience uh, we had, because we had a very nice experience in Egypt. And uh, we found that no, in no, north uh, in Egypt, in Alexandria, we had most of the patients are in the osteopenia range, yet they had high fracture risk. Whereas in the southern part of Egypt, it was mainly osteoporosis rather than anything else. So when we looked at the factors, why then the people in the north are having fragility fractures if their BMD is the osteopenia range? And we found that most of these people having sarcopenia, for example, or having high risk of falls. So you have to consider that osteoporosis does not occur on its own. Osteoporosis can be associated with other risk factors. If we look at exercises, it, uh, when you stimulate, the, uh, when you move the muscles, 
they pull on the periosteum, improve circulation, help in the position of calcium into the periosteum and the bone. If you improve the, if you do uh, exercises to improve the muscle power and muscle strength, this will help sarcopenia, will minimize the risk of falls and fractures. So there is an important role of exercises. I would suggest just it is targeted exercises based on the individual patient's risk. I think the question about track score, with the fracture, uh, spine fracture, maybe it's a good question. So what, what was the question? About vertebral fracture and, and the frax. Okay. I think frax plus can help, please. Yes, yes. well, uh, the old fracture, the old frax will include just whether there is a fragility fracture or not. It does not include whether when this fracture has happened, so with it, whether it happened in the past two years or not, and whether the patient had one fracture or two fractures or three fractures. So uh, in the old FRAX, it would be considered just dichotomous. It is yes, no. In the new FRAX, the FRAX plus, it will consider the recency and it will consider the number of fractures if the patient has more than one vertebral fracture. Also, there's a question about prophylactic treatment and the, I think, anti resorbent meaning, resorbent. Uh, I don't... Do you think there is preventive treatment, Professor Elbidani? Okay. So it depends on what are the underlying risk factors. So, for example, let me, uh, because I, I like the question. In the past, we were focusing mainly on secondary prevention of osteoporosis, meaning that we are waiting for the patient to fracture, and then we start the treatment. Right now, and this is the new development with, between the uh, International Osteoporosis Foundation, IOF, and WHO, and this is what we are even doing in the Egyptian Academy of Bone Health, is what we call early detection of osteoporosis, so exactly like early detection of uh, uh, other cancer or whatever. So yes, there is a room for early detection or what we call primary prevention of osteoporosis, identifying the patients at higher risk of fractures, or, or having uh, osteopenia plus high fracture risk, and you can consider give, giving treatment for them. So our role as, as physician to prevent the primary fracture, the first fracture. Exactly, exactly. This is the, and I think in the coming IOF, this will be the major uh, bullet point that will be discussed in more than one presentation, especially that's the WHO intention to work on. And second about prevention also is patients like with cancer breast, cancer prostate, who are taking androgen depletion therapy, hormone antagonist therapy. Personally in England, we have already uh, services running between uh, us as bone health uh, specialists and the urology teams to assist their patients and consider prophylactic treatment for those of them who have the uh, androgen depletion therapy for more than two years, plus high fracture risk. Indeed, when the first fracture, we need more uh, involvement of physician to detect the risk factors and to, for sure, to to use frax, uh, TBS, and BMD uh, correctly. Not waiting the first fracture as now we know. Uh, That's a problem. You, you need to speak. questions also. Uh, I ask the the director of the uh, webinar. We have time for other questions for Professor. Uh -huh. Bidani. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Yasser. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Masri. Uh, I think just for the sake of the time, we need to move on. And of course, uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Yasser will ask uh, for the rest of uh, the webinar. So we'll have another discussion uh, for the cases and for the next lecture as well. Um, I would like uh, also uh, to welcome uh, Professor Hisham Sayed, uh, Professor of Nephrology and president-elect for uh, the uh, Egyptian Society of Nephrology. Welcome, Professor Hisham. Thank you very much, Professor. I'm, I'm really enjoying, and I got the message. Uh, the important message is we are not so aware about that, uh, about osteoporosis in our patients. So it's a clear message to us and to our colleagues that we have to look about that. And uh, I will have a question, but later on. Thank you so much. Let's move on for the sake of the time. Uh, Professor Rasha Samir is going to introduce uh, the um, first um, you know, case presenter, uh, Dr. Ala El-Sawi. Uh, 
Please go ahead, uh, Rasha. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amr. First of all, I'd like to thank the World Kidney Academy for hosting such rich um, uh, activities. I'd like to thank the um, speakers and moderators. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Ala Abdel Nasser. She's an assistant lecturer of nephrology, Mansoura University, Egypt. Um, she's um, a role model of a combination of talent, attitude, and uh, skills, uh, always works best. Um, She's uh, gonna present an interesting case presentation. I hope you would enjoy it. Uh, welcome everyone. Today I'm gonna present a case with a sucrosis. Our patient is 30 year old female patient, married with one living daughter, aged eight and a half years, housewife with no special habits of smoking or alcohol intake. She has a history of systemic lupus erythematosus since August 2014, and then now she is maintained on low dose steroid and hydrochine 200 milligram per day. Patient developed the end stage kidney disease and now she is maintaining current hemodialysis from left AP fistula three sessions per week since January 2019. The patient was receiving calcium carbonate 500 mg twice daily and alpha fasidol 0.5 microgram per day in the last three months. The patient presents, presented with pain and limited activity of the right forearm after a minor fall onto the ground. Physical examination revealed stable vital signs, BMI with 20 kg per meter square. Obvious swelling deformity and activity limitation on the right distal forearm. X-ray revealed right coolest fracture. Hair DEXA scan showed T-score of minus 2 at the lumbar spine, minus 2.1 at femur neck, and minus 1.4 at total hip. Regarding laboratory investigation of the patient, CBC showed no abnormalities. Serum, serum correct the casam was 9, serum phosphorus was high 6.5 with high BTH level 900 picogram per mil with low 25 hydroxy vitamin D of, 20, uh, of 12 nanogram per mil with active, accepted urea reduction ratio. So our patient has a multiple risk factors of osteoporosis being a female with long standing history of systemic lobus with prolonged corticosteroid therapy CKD on chronic hemodiasis for almost five years with low BMI plus fragility fracture plus low BMD on DEXA scan. So our patient has the osteoporosis associated with high turnover bone disease. Regarding the management of the case of osteoporosis, including CKD patients, the first step is the non-pharmacological treatment, including balanced diet, which includes adequate calcium and vitamin D supplement, with dietary phosphate restriction, stop smoking, limit alcohol intake, weight bearing exercise, and measures to prevent falls. The second step in the management is CKD MD management in our case. Regarding to our patient, her serum calcium was 9, and she was maintained on calcium carbonate 500, gram, 500 milligram twice daily. So, calcium supplement was stopped to, pre to prevent positive calcium overload and uh, prevent cardiovascular calcification. Regarding hyperphosphatemia, vitamin D receptor activator was stopped. non calcium phosphate lowering therapy was initiated. Regarding hyperparathyroidism, cinnamic acid was added to overcome BTH over secretion. Vitamin D stores were replenished, and the parathyroid scan was done for the possibility of parathyroid adenomas. The patient parathyroid scan revealed no adenoma. After six months on cinnamic acid therapy, her lab PTH was 500 picogram per million, which is in the target level, in the target range. Serum corrected calcium was 8.4, serum phosphorus 4.5, with vitamin D 34 nanogram per million. So the next step in the management is, is the choice of anti osteopathic medications. Anti osteopathic therapy preferred based on bone turnover status. If the patient has high or normal bone turnover, anti-resorbitic anti therapy is the best choice. If the patient has low bone turnover, osteoanabolic should be considered. And if the result is borderline, bone biopsy is the ideal standard to determine uh, bone turnover status of the patient. Back to our patient, one specific alkaline phosphate was 25, which is high, and the BTH was 500 picogram per mil. High levels of both bone biomarkers correlates with high turnover. So our patient started denosumab therapy, 60 milligram subcutaneous every 
six months with close monitoring of the therion calcium. We consider following up our patient with monospecific alkaline phosphatase and BTH every three to six months and repeating a DEXA scan after two years. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ella, for this uh, nice case of uh, high turnover bone disease in the Alsace patient, which is uh, very common to see. And um, um, usually, as you mentioned, we start by controlling the metabolic bone disorders. And after this, we move to use either anti-resorbatives or uh, bone anabolics. Uh, would you like to comment, uh, um, Professor Yasser or um, Professor uh, Masri, uh, on this case? Yasser first. Please, go ahead. Okay. Well, I, I think you dealt with it well. I was waiting for the bone-specific alkaline phosphatase as you're going through it, because it will help us to identify the, the as you said, we need to know what is the pathology, how the bone turnover rate in the uh, for this patient so that I can identify what my treatment will be. Uh, the uh, non-pharmacological treatment is essential, as you said, and then you identify as a high bone, bone turnover, which is the expected in such patients. So uh, donosimab is a good choice, actually, and just the patient should be notified or that the treating doctor should be careful because there's always drop of the serum calcium level two weeks after donosimab. So just be careful with the uh, oxygen uh, calcium support if uh, you are giving it. Very good, very good. Very good question what? for you, Dr. Basil and Dr. Yasser. Um, the problem with the dinozumab is usually what we are facing for how long you're going to give it. And once you stop it, there is a good potential that there will be a rebound increase of bone resorption. What would you uh, do with this case after giving, say, a year or two, you know, every six months of dinozumab? Can I answer? Uh, personally, I don't stop it because you okay. don't have alternative. It's a life, lifelong therapy. Exactly. And now it's safe. Uh, what do you think? Uh, sorry, sir. Okay. Now, let, let us see the difference between donosimab as anti-resorptive and bisphosphonates as anti-resorptive. Bisphosphonates mainly are deposited in the outer layer of the bone. So the inhibition of the bone resorption is usually on the outer layer of the bone. And this was actually one of the main reasons for the uh, uh, fissure fractures or the fractures that occur in the femur in patients taking long uh, term of bisphosphonate. In contrast, denosimab actually it works on all layers of the bones. If you are looking at the outcome, it will give you a better outcome in terms of improving the bone mineral density. That's number one. Usually, as I said, we will assist two years after starting the denosimab therapy, which is fair. Now, what will happen if I achieved my target? So if I got improved in the bone mineral density to minus 1.5 to or to minus 2 plus no fractures, if not, I continue up to five years. The question is, what shall I do next? As just the, the colleague asked, and as uh, Dr. Basil said, why to stop? Because it continues to work. And actually, uh, the, the, the recent studies showed that 10 years of the denosumab, it was the only anti-resorptive agent that is helpful to improve the trabecular bone score. The trabecular bone score improved the romososumab, parathyroid hormone, and long-term therapy of donosumab, whereas it was not reported with all the bisosphonates. So continue, no problem. I would add that for a major difference, because this is a dialysis patient or a patient with advanced CKD, that the dinosumab is not uh, uh, retained in patient with kidney failure, so bisphosphonates is renal, renally clear. So uh, we try to adjust the dose. In the past, we used to avoid it, but there is more and more evidence now that we can use it in dialysis patient or patient with <coughs> advanced CKD. But we have to be a little bit careful. We might need to adjust the dose or increase uh, the uh, duration between the uh, injections for the injectable bisphosphonates or uh, give it, you know, instead of 70 milligram alindorinate, we we'll give 35 milligram weekly or instead of 10 milligram daily, we we'll give 5 milligram. And we have also to look to the bone turnover biomarker. 
So I think it's uh, especially in dialysis patient and the vision was advanced uh, uh, chronic kidney disease. We need to uh, see what's going on with the bone turnover biomarker. Of course, bone biopsy is the gold standard, but we are not doing bone biopsy for everyone and you cannot do it every year or two. But I think the non-invasive bone turnover biomarker might help because also there is a risk, I think, uh, in general, uh, giving a, a very long term anti result of that we might put them in a risk of low turnover bone disease. So I think also using the non-invasive uh, biomarker might be helpful. What do you think, Dr. Masri? Um, personally, I don't have experience with bisphosphonate. I've, uh, uh, my colleagues, are, nephrologists are opposing, but you, now you give more information and uh, update about that. But indeed, it's difficult to manage because you need to have many uh, uh, monitoring many markers and many assessment to, to in order to adjust the, the dose of bisphosphonate. Uh, uh, but in, in, uh, in opposite for uh, denosumab, I think it's easier and you don't have this headache to, uh, to do all these markers. And uh, you know that patients are not always compliant <laughs> to respect the dose and the half dose and the, the, the to, to the, the duration also. They are not always in ta on time to come Except in your case, in, 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 uh, when there is hemodialysis, they, you see them regularly more than us as rheumatologists. So uh, for my, uh, to, be, to be really not have uh, issues with patient out problem, I, I prefer keep uh, denosumab as treatment. So okay, I have a question, Dr. Masri and Dr. Yasser, please. If, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So if you are giving denosumab and you have a stable BMD, and you know if you stop denosumab, you could have a rebound vertebral fracture, for example. So can you depend on bone turnover markers to uh, stop denosumab or withhold denosumab? So you can do BTMs maybe uh, after denosumab, denosumab injection and uh, after six months to see if you can skip one or two injections. Personally, I have no experience in this. Uh, you are talking about patient with the chronic kidney disease or? Uh, no, no, just uh, osteoporotic. Yeah, in general. Mm, I don't have experience in this. I don't do this. Just uh, when, I, when I reach the, the normal and I need to stop it, I just consolidate with bisphosphonate. And usually I use zeronidric acid. It's easier. It's one, it's one injection uh, than uh, the weekly or the monthly uh, in, my, in, my, in my practice. Uh, however, just I noticed something. I don't know if you noticed the same, Dr. Yasser. When we stop uh, denosumab and we uh, consolidate with bisphosphonate, particularly zoronidin acid, we have a very severe uh, painful uh, flu syndrome more than using uh, uh, zoronidin acid uh, uh, naive from the beginning. So let me just answer the bone turnover because that's that, this is a very interesting question. And uh, uh, I, I like it because it's coming from nephrology. <laughs> <laughs> the reason for this is I used bone turnover for nearly three years and I couldn't make any sense of the outcome of the bone, uh, by, by bone markers throughout the three years in relation to the osteoporosis management. Nephrology can be a unique uh, area because th there is dynamic change in the bone. You are playing with the bone by adjusting the kidney function, so you can see some changes. I don't have much experience, of course, with bone uh, uh, biomarkers with kidney. Perhaps you will be more than me using this. But in terms of normal osteoporosis patients, I will not use bone markers. They don't do much. I cannot rely on them. You can use, for example, alkaline phosphatase when there's a fracture. So when you see high alkaline phosphatase, I'm not explainable. I do bone specific alkaline phosphatase. If it is bone, I search because I went one day, I got a cancer patient, patient diagnosed of cancer. GP is just all he's noticed is that the alkaline phosphatase is going up. And that's all. And he sent to me saying, I'm worried. I don't know what's going on. So screening, we found cancer in the bones. Uh, but apart from that, I cannot rely on the bone my uh, biomarkers in standard practice for management of standard osteoporosis patients. Indeed, I, I used bone, bone uh, turnover markers uh, 15 years ago for a few years, and I was disappointed 
it's not practical and I stop it. And now no lab in Jordan is to uh, use them because it's really, it, I was the only or a few, two, three people use it in Jordan. And no lab now use uh, can uh, analyze it because we don't ask it. It's business, unfortunately. Very nice, very, very healthy discussion, <laughs> very thoughtful. Thank you so much. I think for the sake of the time, we need to move on uh, to the next lecture. And uh, uh, Professor Amani Musa, uh, Professor of Endocrinology in Mansoura University, is going to introduce uh, Dr. Fatma Hamdi um, yeah, for the next uh, uh, talk. So um, I think uh, I cannot find uh, Professor Amani. Maybe she has a problem with the internet. So can can you, Dr. Rasha, can you please introduce Dr. Fatma, please, if you are with us? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague, Dr. Fatma Hamdi, um, for uh, pre presenting an interesting topic. I hope you enjoy um, her presentation as well. Fatma, please uh, go on. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express my happiness for uh, participation in this meeting. Uh, today, we will talk about wound health in autoimmune diseases. As all we know that patients with autoimmune diseases, most of them are females. Uh, they are suffering from uh, systemic inflammation, mainly affecting uh, joints, which lead to uh, uh, joint deformity, destruction, immobility, and high risk of falls. And you are using multiple medications, mainly immune suppressive medications and steroids. All these factors will affect bone health in patients with autoimmune diseases. Today, we will talk about effect of inflammation on bone health, effect of anti-rheumatic drugs on bone health, osteoporosis in common autoimmune diseases, and management of osteoporosis in autoimmune diseases. We will start by effect of inflammation on bone health. Inflammation is the body's response to different pathogens and tissue damage. Uh, lead to activation of cells of both innate and adaptive immune response and production of cytokines. It can affect several organs, including bone, leading to imbalance in bone remodeling. Systemic osteoporosis and increased fracture rates have been described in chronic inflammatory diseases and is associated with increased bone uh, resorption and impaired bone formation. The role of inflammation in bone fragility is insufficiently recognized as most of the patients are uh, receiving glucocorticoids. Optimal control of inflammation is a part of control of osteoporosis. How can inflammation affect the bone health? We have the pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is which has a role in increasing osteoclastogenesis and osteoclastic activity. We have also the B and T lymphocytes, which have a role in bone remodeling. We will talk about uh, T lymphocytes role in another slide. We have the autoantibodies. One of them is the ACBUS, which is associated with uh, bone erosion and systemic bone loss in rheumatoid arthritis. Also, uh, decreased uh, osteoplast and osteocyst is observed during inflammation. Uh, osteoclast, as all we know, is derived from uh, monocyte macrophage, macrophage lineage and thus share common progenitors and receptors with cells of the immune system. As we are dealing with lymphocytes, T lymphocytes are uh, main secretors of cytokines, one of them is the TNF, which stimulate the osteoclastic activity under the effect of Frank. We have also the interleukin 1, which can enhance the osteoclast formation and lifespan. Also, interleukin 6, which is a target of a parathormone to recruit osteoclasts. We have also the T helper 17, which is the most osteoclastogenic subset of uh, T cells, play a pivotal role in the bone loss of inflammatory conditions uh, like psoriasis. It induces uh, osteoclastogenesis by secreting a number of uh, cytokines, in including interleukin 17, which stimulates the release and potentiate the osteoclastogenic effect of Frank ligand. On the other hand, we have the T regulatory uh, cells, which have a protective effect against the TNF induced uh, bone loss. And the balance between the T helper 17 and the T regulatory cells is important for bone remodeling during inflammatory process. Uh, this diagram shows the effect of uh, lymphocytes, T and B lymphocytes, on uh, the bone health and bone remodeling. Uh, we have here the, uh, uh, the osteoclastic activation. 
uh, under the effect of the RAND. The T cells, we have the T uh, helper 17, which secretes the uh, T helper 1, which stimulate the osteoclastic genesis. We have also the interleukin 1, interleukin 6, and uh, TNF alpha, which are released from the macrophages and also stimulate the osteoclastic genesis. Uh, on the other hand, we have the T regulatory uh, cells, which will inhibit the osteoclastic genesis under the effect of Cetella 4. We have also uh, other uh, cytokines like interleukin 4 and interferon gamma, which has uh, inhibitory effect on the osteoclastogenesis. Uh, also, we can find that interleukin 1, interleukin 6, and TNF alpha have uh, inhibitory effect on the uh, osteoplasts. On the other hand, uh, the uh, role of the B lymphocytes, we can find the ACBUS, one of the most important antibodies in rheumatoid arthritis, which stimulate the uh, osteoclastic uh, osteoclastogenesis and osteoclastic activity. Uh, now we will talk about effect of anti-rheumatic drugs on bone health. And of course, the most important drug is the glucocorticoids. Uh, glucocorticoid treatment is associated with osteoporosis and fractures. Uh, the most common cause of medication and use osteoporosis, over 30% of glucocorticoid-treated subjects uh, experiencing an osteoporotic fractures and over 10% develop osteonecrosis. Glucocorticoid-treated subjects often, uh, often fracture with higher bone uh, density, uh, and this means that glucocorticoid may alter bone strength in addition to the bone mass, so the threshold for uh, diagnosing uh, glucocorticoid uh, osteoporosis is uh, different from the post osteoporosis. Not the mechanism of glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. Glucocorticoids affect all parts of bone remodeling cycle. It will lead to increase osteoclastic activity, reduce osteogenesis from zinchymal stem cells, and direct their differentiation to adipocytes. It also reduces the maturation, lifespan, and function of the osteoplasts. It leads to autophagy, apoptosis of osteocytes and osteoplasts, which lead to lacunal enlargement and increased bone fragility. In addition, it will reduce bone vascularity by decreasing vascular endothelial growth factor, uh, which leads to a reduction in the bone strength. And this is an important cause for osteonecrosis, which may occur with uh, glucocorticoids. And of course, as all we know, that there is a negative calcium balance with reduced GIT absorption and elevated urinary excretion. What's about fracture evaluation in uh, glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis? It is uh, challenging, and uh, uh, the FRAX uh, an instrument is not uh, sufficient in this. Uh, uh, and I think Dr. Uh, Yasser have uh, demonstrated this in the FRAX Plus as the, uh, the FRAX, which um, uh, answer the question of glucocorticoid use as, as yes or no. Uh, however, there, uh, there is a modification in the FRAX and the FRAX plus, and uh, according to the dose of steroid patient uh, is using. And also it needs, it's needed to incorporate the uh, risk of fall and also the severity of the underlying inflammatory disease in the fracture assessment. What about other uh, anti-rheumatic drugs as regard uh, conventional synthetic demards? Uh, studies done on this uh, topic found no effect on uh, of these uh, demards on bone mineral density. However, the biologics uh, targeting cytokines like the anti-TNF, anti-interleukin-6, and anti-interleukin-17 was found to cause decline in the bone resorption and improvement in the bone mineral density as regard Jack inhibitors, which inactivates the STAT3 in osteoplast, may lead to lower uh, bone mass, and further study studies are required in uh, this uh, on this drug in the, on these drugs. Now we will talk about osteoporosis and common autoimmune diseases. We will start with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which is the common uh, autoimmune uh, diseases. Rheumatoid arthritis is associated with bone loss, either a localized bone loss in the form of erosions and periarticular osteopenia, as we can find in this uh, hand X-ray. Also, it may lead to a generalized bone loss in the form of osteoporosis, and it was found that bone erosions can predict generalized bone loss in these patients. Bone fragility in rheumatoid arthritis have many factors. We have the clinical risk factors of being females in very menopausal period. We have the systemic inflammation, the presence of acubus, which is very important. We have also the mechanical uh, factors and medications, mainly glucocorticoids. What's the pathogenesis of osteoporosis in rheumatoid arthritis? We have augmented cytokine release, and as we mentioned before, the uh, role of TNF, interleukin-1, and interleukin-6 in osteoporosis. We have systemic and local release of metalloproteinases that can directly degrade bone tissue. Uh, 
in uh, in RA, the principal source of rank ligand is uh, CD4 and CD8 T uh, cells, which lead to more osteoclastogenesis and increase in bone formation. We have also increased DKK1 production due to uh, inflammatory cytokines such as TNF, and this is partially mediated by the PTH, and this suggests why patients with vitamin D deficiency may have more systemic and uh, localized uh, bone loss in case of rheumatoid arthritis. Now we will talk about uh, the ACBAS. The ACBAS, these are antibodies which are specific for uh, rheumatoid arthritis, associated with poor bo uh, bone outcome, with more periarticular bone erosion and more systemic bone loss. Uh, presence of enzymes for citrullination of proteins on the osteoclast precursor, leading to expression of citrullinated dementine on osteoclastic surface, and ACBAS can target uh, this binding of ACBAS uh, to uh, these citrullinated proteins, leading to production of TNF, which enhanced the osteoclastic formation and activity. And it was observed that patients with ACBAS has uh, bone loss that can already be present before clinical signs of synovitis. So the bone loss is not related to the inflammation, it's related to the presence of ACBAS. As regard evaluation, um, are a patient at a risk of fracture who uh, are patients who are older than 50 years and patients with persistent activity, fracture risk can be assessed by FRAX. Uh, and uh, bone mineral density measurement is the uh, method uh, of uh, the method of choice for assessment. Uh, and it's uh, recommended to, uh, uh, and imaging for vertebral, uh, for vertebrae is recommended for uh, asymptomatic vertebral fractures due to uh, the frequent use of steroids and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in these patients. As regular prevention, we have the lifestyle modification, sufficient calcium and vitamin D intake. Uh, prescription of DMARDs is very important to control the inflammation with uh, DMARDs and as regular the steroids, it's, it's very important to minimize the dose and duration of glucocorticoid treatment and follow the guidelines for uh, steroid-induced osteoporosis. And also the biological treatment is associated with decrease in the osteoclastic activity and improvement in the uh, uh, bone uh, density. So, uh, 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 biologics should be used whenever uh, they are indicated in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Now we will talk about ankylosing spondylitis. Ankylosing spondylitis is a disease which mainly affects young aged males. The hallmark of the disease is new bone formation, not erosion like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and steroids are rarely used in uh, uh, treatment of ankylosing sp spondylitis. And in spite of all these factors, we can find that osteoporosis can be found in uh, these patients. And this is a classic example for the effect of inflammation on bone health. Spondyloarthropathy, uh, osteo osteoporosis is well-recognized feature of uh, axial spondyloarthropathy. It's reported as an early event. It can be related only to, uh, it, it cannot be related only to spine ankylosis and immobility. A spa is characterized by excessive local bone formation and concomitant systemic bone loss. As we can see in this X-ray, we can find that these projections, these are called syndesmophytes. These are a, a new bone formation, which is local uh, at the site of the inflammation. And we have also systemic bone loss. Again, treatment with anti-TNF is associated with increase in the bone mineral density. Osteoporosis in spondyloarthropathy may be generalized due to systemic inflammation, and it was found that HLA-B27 transgenic fat has decreased bone strength and increased rank ligand, and also the rank ligand level in the serum was elevated in these patients. We have also local bone loss at the sites of uh, osteitis and bone marrow edema. We can find this uh, MRI for the sacroiliac joints, and here we can find the uh, areas of bone marrow edema. Also, this is MRI for the spine, and we can find here the areas for uh, bone marrow edema, which is presence of these lesions in the, in the MRI is straight with five-fold increase in risk of having low hip and spine or mineral density. Bone fragility fraction in the spa having many factors like systemic inflammation, metabolic factors like vitamin D deficiency, and also the mechanical factors of immobility and uh, uh, risk of falls. There is increased risk of fracture in patients with older age, persistent active disease, long disease duration, spine ankylosis and immobility, male gender with low BMI, and also the risk of falls. As regard bone mineral density assessments in patients with SPA, uh, uh, syndesmophytes are a cause of artifactual increase of lumbar density and uh, of lumbar spine bone mineral density. We can find here in this X-ray that this X-ray spine can find with new bone formation which is called syndesmophytes. Also here, we can find the calcification of the uh, spinal uh, ligaments. All, 
all, all these will lead to artifacts in the uh, lumbar spine bone mineral density. So quantitative CT is better than DEXA for evaluation, uh, for evaluation of uh, bone mineral density. And also, uh, uh, the prevalence of low bone mineral density increase with the use of quantitative CT. And if you are using DEXA, it's preferred to evaluate the hip in pay, uh, the hips, uh, bone mineral density in patients with syndesmophytes. And also, imaging of the vertebrae is indicated due to high prevalence of asymptomatic vertebral fracture. As regards the prevention, we have anti-inflammatory drugs, which have a beneficial effect as regards increasing uh, the mobility by relieving the pain and also di direct effect on the bone by uh, in, uh, improving and relieving the inflammation. Risk of clinical fracture was decreased in patient taking non-steroidal and also several prospective studies revealed that TNF blockers show a positive effect on the bone mineral density. Now we will talk about systemic lupus, which is a chronic systemic autoimmune disease affecting women in their reproductive years. Increased survival leads to increased attention to chronic complications as osteoporosis. The use of anti-epileptic drugs and oral anticoagulants is an independent risk factor for fracture in SLE. About 29 to 35 percent of patients with at least one vertebral fracture has normal bone mineral density, and this means that there is a limited value of bone mineral density measurement in the assessment uh, of fracture risk. Due, and this means also that the fracture in SLE is multifactorial. What are the risk factors of osteoporosis in SLE patients? We have the inflammation, chronic inflammation contribute to this. There is also increased serum level of TNF. There is uh, um, also significant decrease in the bone mineral density in SLE patients with more disease flares. We have the metabolic effect in the form of defect in vitamin D production and activation in secondary hyperparathyroidism. We have the hormonal factor that was found that, that dehydroepi and androsterone was described to be lower in SLE patients, and also premature ovarian failure to, due to cyclophosphamide may contribute to osteoporosis in these patients. We have the medication because majority of SLE patients are on chronic glucocorticoid treatment, and there is a dose-dependent relationship between glucocorticoid use and bone loss, and also the hydroxy hydroxychloroquine, which may cause decrease in vitamin D activation. Vitamin D deficiency is L in SLE patients have multiple causes. We have avoidance of sun exposure and sunscreen use. We had renal failure, disease activity, glucocorticoids, and also the hydroxychloroquine. As regards the prevention, we have lifestyle measures, adequate calcium and vitamin D intake, and anti-resortive drugs. Now we will talk briefly about management of osteoporosis in autoimmune diseases. Here we have the ACR guidelines for the uh, management of uh, glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. We should classify the patient uh, according to a risk, a fracture risk assessment into high, moderate, and low uh, fracture risk, uh, whether the patient is more than 40 years or less than uh, 40 years. We have also the bone mineral density assessment, which is indicated in all patients who are more than 40 years uh, uh, after starting glucocorticoid uh, treatment within six months. If the patient is less than uh, 40 years, uh, it's indicated that the patient is having osteoporotic fracture or other significant uh, risk factors. As regards prevention, we have the non pharmacological or the life, uh, lifestyle modification form of calcium, vitamin D intake. As we should maintain the vitamin D level more than 30 nanogram per milli to augment the calcium absorption and also improve the muscle strength and the balance. Uh, we have also the lifestyle modification. These measures should be uh, given to all adults taking prednisolone more than 2.5 milligram for more than three months. As regard also uh, oral bisphosphonate should be given to patients with uh, moderate to high risk. According to the risk assessment, if the patient is low risk, so there is just the uh, lifestyle modification and calcium and vitamin D supplementation. If the patient is moderate or high risk, we should uh, uh, the patient should receive anti-resortive according to being and women and child uh, peering potential. The first line will be oral bisphosphonates. And uh, after this, it will be the teriparatide. And then uh, the other lines like IV bisphosphonate or denosumab in patients with uh, women not in uh, child bearing potential and men, we will start with oral bisphosphonates. And the second line will be IV bisphosphonate, teriparatide, and denosumab. And raluxifen can be given for postmenopausal women. Now it's time for conclusion. Autoimmune rheumatic diseases are associated with osteoporosis due to many causes as inflammation, glucocorticoids, and immobility. Inflammation can lead to systemic osteoporosis. Control of inflammation is very important to protect the bone health. 
glucocorticoids lead to reduction in bone mineral density and bone strength by several mechanisms. Several biologics are suggest suggested to have bone protective effect as anti-TNF, anti-interleukin-17, and anti-interleukin-6. Rheumatologists should follow the guidelines for prevention and treatment of steroid-induced osteo osteoporosis. This was my references, and thank you. Phenomenal. Uh, very, very nice uh, lecture, Dr. Fatma. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Basel, uh, Dr. Yasser, would you like to comment? Yes, it's a very good review. <clears throat> well done. Just interesting, the hydroxychloroquine causing vitamin D deficiency. Is that an association or there is a cause for that? Dr. Fatma, can you answer? Uh, really, I don't know uh, the answer to this question, but I have read that there is uh, one of the factors which may contribute to the vitamin uh, D deficiency in SME patient that uh, it's related to that vi uh, hydroxychloroquine may, be, may have a role in inhibition of uh, vitamin uh, D activation. Uh, but I don't know whether it's uh, activation or this is, uh, sorry, is association or there is a proven, uh, proven role for this. I think we have used it in the past in vision with sarcoidosis to inhibit activation of uh, the one hydroxylase enzyme. <laughs> we have very interesting case, um, transgender lady, and uh, she had hypercalcemia, he or she, I don't know. Anyway, uh, from the breast uh, augmentation that start to uh, secrete, uh, you know, active form of vitamin D. So, but anyway, we have published this, but uh, yes, I think it can inhibit activation of vitamin D. Thank you so much. So uh, we have some questions in the chat box. Dr. Yasser, uh, uh, would you comment on the effect of newer uh, lupus therapies like voclosporin, Benlesta, on uh, the bone health? Well, look, we when we look at lupus in general, so we have to prioritize the, the issues. Number one is I need to control the disease because the disease activity by itself is a predisposing factor for osteoporosis. So osteoporosis here actually it will be number three. So it will be under, I need to control the disease. I need to prevent the comorbidities, particularly the kidney and all other, the major organs. Then I will consider the osteoporosis. The, when we consider steroids for uh, hydrox for lupus, it's again, it's the cumulative dose of the steroids, not the pulse, for example. So it's a cumulative dose of the steroids over a long period will have the significant impact on the bone health. Um, as I said, I, whatever it is, I will use it to control the disease activity. Then I will assess what's left for me. So this is how I will look at the case. But osteoporosis will not be, yes, it's on the table, but not the priority. It could be number three or four. What's left for Voclosborin and Belesta? Does he have direct or indirect effect on our bone health, you know, regardless of the control of the disease? It can be, but but you, you, need, you need to remember that in, in managing this with Belesta or whatever, I need to do the induction first, then I do the maintenance, even with the, with the biologics. So through controlling the disease activity, yes, definitely will it have an impact. Because if I control the disease activity, I will lower the dose of the steroids. I can may lower the other dose, even the hydroxychloroquine can be one tablet a day instead of two. So by doing this, I can help the bone health in general. But as I said, you have to consider the patient has <clears throat> dyslipidemia, diabetes, and whether diabetes second to osteoporosis or not, patient has renal impairment or not. But in D status, and then you you need to, it's it's a Pandora box. It's not just uh, one one question, one answer. It's many questions and many answers, and every patient will be have his treatment tailored to her own condition. Yes, I, I agree with Dr. Yasser. I think it's 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 uh, when it become to flare up of rheumatic disease, particularly SLE. Unfortunately, we don't prioritize osteoporosis. It's become the, the second line because we need to 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 uh, to stop to, to the flare up and to to manage the comorbidities. And then and uh, it's different from primary osteoporosis because we have that issue treated directly. 
In this case, we, we, there is a lot of medication. You know, uh, Professor Yasser mentioned also diabetes. We have a, this patient have many uh, comorbidities and uh, osteoporosis become uh, not priority. This is the reason I prefer, I prefer without having any sponsor here, uh, uh, denizumab in this case to use because it's not uh, bisphosphonate in daily or monthly or weekly uses. Uh, because we should also consider that the uh, risk factor increase with flare up increase with uh, with high active active disease. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, do you have any further question? I think Muhammad Ahmed raised his hand. Uh, he might have a question. Uh, yes, <clears throat> thanks, doctors, for such elegant and informative talks. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first, a non steroidal what is the rule really it's not that clear for me uh, does it decrease the risk for fracture um, is it a good uh, glucocorticoid sparing or whatever i want to be more confident about it uh, second um, um, a big professor uh, uh, of mine Dr. Ayman Garf said in uh, the guidelines, a uh, glucocorticoid must be five milligrams and not to exceed it. And uh, the picture um, in moderate risk assessment, uh, that those must be uh, over 7.5 uh, uh, coupled with Z score below. Um, three minus three uh, to be high risk so i think it's reasonable for using just five milligrams of glucocorticoid what's your reply for this and thanks thank you muhammad would you like to uh, comment dr yasu okay non-steroidal anti-inflammatory it is not a long-term therapy non anti-inflammatory, we definitely recommend not to take it more than a month on a regular basis. So I'm not so much worried about use of non anti-inflammatory as um, a, a negative, to have a negative impact on the bone. Any patient who will have, we taking non for a year, he will end by renal failure and we'll send him to Dr. Arm. So who we'll finish. <laughs> uh, I, I will not definitely, I would discourage all my patients not to take non-steroidal anti-inflammatory on a regular basis for more than a month. Um, uh, it cannot be... Uh, uh, Steroid-sparing drug is, is actually is not non-steroidal. Steroid-sparing drug is to control the disease. Control the disease by your demand therapy, by your biologic therapy, or whatever. Whatever you have with you. But this is the best thing. I don't use oral steroids at all. At all. Uh, for my patient with inflammatory arthritis, of course, lupus is a separate story, giant cell arthritis and polymyalgia aromatica, these are different stories. But rheumatoid arthritis, there is no room for systemic steroids, and actually many patients are taking already <laughs> steroids and not improved. Coming now to the second dose, um, the, the, the dose of the steroids. Well, the, the, I can't remember, you are talking about the slide that I show or someone else show. The slide I showed is less than 2.5, from 2.5 to 7.5 and more than 7.5. These are not my markers. That's the inter that's the international cutoff point. So I'm not the one who put these figures uh, from my own mind. Uh, um, it, with the guidelines, I will I will strongly recommend that we have already published guidelines for uh, osteoporosis management. Uh, I'm speaking about Egypt osteoporosis management in even renal failure stage four, stage and uh, five, and in hemodialysis. We published also uh, guidelines for management of osteoporosis. These are all evidence-based, and I will definitely encourage you to look at them because they will give you a clue about what to do next. Uh, lastly, if you are worried about the dose of the steroids, do the FRAX Plus. It will do that calculation for you without you bothering your mind about what's the impact factor that will be uh, reflected on the fracture risk at the end. So much for the same uh, I think for the sake of, of the time, uh, because we are uh, running a little bit late, we need to move on. Um, our next speaker is our webinar organizer, 
Dr. Mohamed Mamdouh Abdelbari. Um, I'm biased when I introduce uh, Mohamed Mamdouh Abdelbari um, because um, I'm his mentor. He was trained in, in our center at University of Kentucky for a year. Um, I was um, his thesis supervisor. He did a fantastic job. He has um, uh, thesis, the MD thesis was uh, assessment of bone, kidney, and heart health uh, in patients and osteoporotic patients and the relationship between urinary calcium excretion and the bone loss, the heart uh, events, and the uh, kidney function. And he did a fantastic job. He, I think, I, I stopped counting, but uh, I think he published with me at least maybe 10 articles, I don't know. Um, he's very smart, very talented, and have a passion for metabolic bone disorder. Um, and I really appreciate uh, seeing him organizing this big webinar and a lot of other, uh, you know, programs as well. Please go ahead, Mamdou. Uh, can you... <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amr. Yani, uh, Dr. Amr was my, my mentor in the University of Kentucky, and I, I couldn't be uh, more proud about this. And uh, thank you for the panel, the moderators, uh, attendee. Thank you, Professor Yasser Medani. Uh, he did not hesitate when I um, asked him to join this webinar. So I'm just going to present this, uh, this case, and I hope it can... Uh, Add to the discussion about osteoporosis and patient with uh, autoimmune disorders. So we have Mrs. B. L. She is 60 year old Caucasian female married with two of his brain. She is non alcoholic. She was a smoker for 20 years and stopped smoking two years ago. Her monopause was at the age of 46. She is diabetic type 2 for 15 years. She was uh, first on oral anti-diabetic medications and shif shifted to insulin, basal bolus regimen, seven years ago. She had a positive history of neuropathy and retinopathy. She is also <laughs> at a higher CKD with EGFR of 58. She is hypertensive 16 years ago on lisinopril and amlodipine. She has a history of coronary artery disease with BCI and stent five years ago. And she has rheumatoid arthritis, mucetorgizate, and delphonamide. Her BMI is 35 with no, with no weight change have been observed in last year. So this patient was actually referred to University uh, of Kentucky Bone Clinic when I was there after she recently discovered that she had multiple vertebral fractures while doing a vertebral fracture assessment. So we will go back um, through this patient history. Seven years ago, this patient was, uh, she fractured her wrist and ribs while her foot slipped over the board. And back then, her lab uh, was good, like the calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D, IPTH were within the normal range. Alkaline phosphatase was uh, 190 international unit per liter. Serum creatinine was good, and her albumin was, was 3.9. And back then, seven years ago, her DEXA scan at uh, the femoronic, the lowest T score here is minus 1.9 at the left femoral neck. While uh, her DEXA scan at lumbar spine, the T score was 0.6 and the lowest was 0.0. So, the first question back then, her treating physician told her that she had osteoporosis and that she will need to take elemental calcium, vitamin D, and to start oral bisphosphonate. So, the first question would do you agree with his diagnosis and the decision to start anti osteoporotic medication if the, even the patient did not have uh, DEXA scan BMD? Uh, less than minus uh, 2.5. And <clears throat> I think that the patient is osteopenic by DEXA BMD, but the diagnosis of osteoporosis and the need to start anti osteoporotic medication are established by the clinical evidence of documented osteoporotic fracture. So here is just a reminder that we, we can diagnose osteoporosis clinically, even if the BMD is not, even if the T score is not below minus 2.5 with the presence of fragility fracture or using the FREX uh, score when the 10-year probability of fracture is equal or more than 20% of major osteoporotic fracture or equal or more than 3% of the hip fracture. So I tried to use the FREX and the FREX plus to calculate here um, 
the risk of fracture. So here you can see the FREX result. The risk of measure, uh, the risk of hip fracture is 6.5%. Uh, the risk of major osteoporotic fracture is 16%. To use the Frex Plus, you have to enter the Frex Plus website. Did, um, uh, you have to uh, create your username and password, and you have to have an account on it. Then it gives you like five credits, as Professor Almedani said. So you have five patients to uh, enter and enjoy that you calculate the Frex Plus for them. The Frex Plus allow you to adjust for these factors. So you could adjust for probabil uh, probability according to recent fracture. You could adjust <coughs> according to the duration of diabetes or adjust according to recent falls. These, the green ones are related to our case. So this patient was not on glucocorticoid, did not have TBS, and we I did not enter the BMD and uh, we did not have the hip axis lens. So when I try to adjust for uh, diabetes, I found that the hip fracture is doubled, like the, the risk of a hip fracture was like 6.5, so it went up to 13%. When I adjusted for diabetes duration more than 10 years, the same patient. So osteoporosis can be characterized by low bone strength due to bone quantity and or bone quality, and our patient could have a bone quality problem. That is why her BMD is not very low while she fractured, or maybe the DEXA scan is not uh, giving us her, her, her true BMD. We have additional tools of trabecular bone score. The trabecular bone score is basically a software depend on an algorithm which sees a gray level variation in the vertebral spine. So as you can see here, uh, this BMD of two different patients, and they have uh, similar BMD, but when we uh, assess the trabecular bone score, this patient below, they have more trabecular separation, and her TBS is 1.1. We have also the hip structure analysis. It is some sort of like the trabecular bone score, but it is related to hip, but uh, it is not consistently demonstrated superiority when... Uh, it is correlated with uh, DEX and QCT, but its um, idea is it can estimate the structural probabilities of the femur combined with clinical characteristics to calculate what's called the femoral strength index, or how well the femur can withstand a direct impact to the greater trochanter. This patient was lucky. She had like the QCT seven years ago, and we found that her lumbar spine T-score, the one was uh, in DEX scan, it was 0 0.0, while in QCT here, it was uh, minus 2.9, or it, actually it is near minus 3. And the femoral nectar score, I think, was a bit similar, minus 1.3. So why was the DEXA scan overestimating hair bone quantity? Could it be obesity, diabetes, coronary artery disease? Could it be rheumatoid arthritis? So... BMD is positively correlated with BMI. So if, if you have a patient who obese who is a herb MD could give you like um, a false positive result or it could underestimate the risk of fracture. Also patient with diabetes mellitus have higher BMD and DEXA scan may underestimate the fracture risk. Other limitation of DEXA scan include confound the effect of the calcification and osteoarthritis in the lumbar spine, which are, are not uncommon. Also, this patient has coronary artery calcification score, which was very high. So this could also add to the underestimation of her uh, uh, fracture risk by doing a DEXA scan. So back to the patient. From the record, the patient had DEXA BMD, which was stable over the last seven years, while she was maintained on bisphosphonate. The patient was not offered a bisphosphonate holiday, and she presented to the clinic the current time with a vertebral fracture, which are often painless and not uncommon. So how would you like to manage this patient? So, and the option to it to either to start more potent anti-resorbative medication like zoldoronic acid or tenozumab, or to start teriparatide or other osteoanabolic medication, or to continue in the same regimen as BMD is stable. The last option was to order for pontin overmarker and other laboratory. So we ordered for the uh, uh, Bunten overmark 
you can find here that the bone specific alkaline phosphatase and the osteocalcin as markers of bone formation, they are within normal range. The trap 5 p and NTX were a bit high. BTH is 20, calcium uh, is 8.9. She has a bit hypercalciuria. Vitamin D is 35. So, as Dr. Medani said, bone turnover marker were not uh, conclusive in this patient. So we have the option now to start teriparatide or mesozumab as a patient may have low bone turnover due to the long-term use of bisphosphonate as anti-resorbative or to use more potent anti-resorbative, maybe donozumab, or to order a bone biopsy. So the patient was offered the option of bone biopsy, and she had agreed or not. I think Professor uh, Husseini did her bone biopsy, and here is the scheduling for tetracycline labeling before the bone biopsy. And her bone biopsy, as you can see, like it is the cortex and the trabeculae, and the histologic finding where a marked decrease in the cortex, increase in the porosity of cortical bone, decrease in the cancellous volume and trabecular sickness, increase in trabecular separation. All of it, it means she has very low uh, bone volume, osteoid volume in low normal range, low osteoid volume due to decreased diffraction of trabecular surface, and there is decrease in osteoblast bone uh, interface and the increase of osteoclast. And when we uh, did like the tetracycline labeling, you can see here that the patient has only single label of tetracycline, which indicates that the patient has a uh, very low bone formation. Uh, normal, in the normal uh, patient, you could see like the double labeling here. Here you can see only a single label. So in conclusion, and uh, of this uh, bone biopsy report, it, the patient has osteoporosis with marked decrease of bone turnover and decrease of bone formation and the mild increase in bone resorption. Bone biopsy could be helpful in patient with osteoporosis to establish bone quality or degree of mineralization when you could not assess the bone turnover or the mechanism of bone loss to uh, use either anti-resorbative or osteoanabolic medication or to analyze the treatment effect on bone structure and bone turnover. <coughs> so this patient is starts with osteoanabolic, I think, teriparatide, uh, and she was doing good on it. And uh, this this paper is from like my MD thesis. We did like Professor Al Hussein said on post tumorbosal osteoporosis women. And what was interesting is that we found low bone turnover in bone biopsy. In 44% of patients with primary osteoporosis who were treatment naive pre biopsy. So, this patient did not have uh, bisphosphonate pre bone biopsy, and 44% of them had low bone turnover. And in kidney patient, Professor Hassani was like the uh, leading author of this study, and we found that 84% of CKD patients uh, who are pre dialysis had low bone turnover disease. And thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mando, for this uh, nice case. Again, it opened the door for a lot of questions and the discussion. Uh, would you like to uh, comment, uh, Professor Yasser? Well, I like it. <clears throat> uh, I did a study years ago about the uh, bone health in uh, and osteoporosis in, uh, in diabetes, diabetes. That was before even we are aware of what's going on. And always BMD will find it relatively high in diabetic patients in comparison to control of uh, matched age and sex patients. So this patient is not different from there. Uh, uh, one more factor, another factor for increasing bone mineral density is DISH, diffuse vascular skeletal hyperostosis. I looked at the DEXA scan picture. There was no ossification in the spines. Uh, but uh, it can appear, and this can increase also the bone mineral density in patients with diabetes. Regarding this specific patient, her BMD in the spine was good, and uh, as, as far as I remember, this was before she developed the osteoporotic fracture, the, the vertebral fracture, but her BMD at one of the hips, I think the left one was minus 1.8, whereas the other one was good. However, the only high uh, ten year probability of fracture was her hip. It was six and it become fifteen as far as I remember. Uh, and in such case, I will go for romosocimab rather than parathyroid hormone 
spar thyroid will help the, the spine, will not help much the, the hip. So I will go either romosocimab or donosimab as my option. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, Dr. Basser, would you like to comment? Yeah, I, I, I really agree with Dr. Yasser for this case. Uh, just one question. There is no TBS in this case uh, at that time? Uh, no, we did not have TBS. Like uh, It was like seven or okay. eight years ago. No, okay. I so uh, I have a question, Dr. Dr. Yasser. So romosozumab, I, I think it is... Um, um, you can start romosozumab in this patient because romosozumab can also increase bone formation while decreasing bone resorption. But why do you want to start donosumab while her uh, bone biopsy reveals that she has very low bone formation? Do you fear that, do you not fear that donosumab could uh, lower her bone turnover? No, as I said, number one, I will go for romosozumab. This is the, the best option for us. But <laughs> when I'm looking at what can help the hip? This is my concern because the, the, you may lose more <laughs> with the DEXA scan of the hip after giving parathyroid hormone. And your main risk factor was fracture hip. So yeah. I'm putting the patient at risk of sustaining another fracture. That's mm -hmm. why I was thinking of how can I protect? But as I said, the best option for her will be romosocimab for one year, then donosimab continue for two or three years. The age, several studies showed it will continue adding to the bone mineral density. I completely agree with you, uh, Professor Yasser. Uh, by the way, uh, I just have two quick comments. Uh, the first comment is uh, a dynamic bone disease has different varieties and the pattern, but the worst pattern is to have suppressed the bone formation with increased bone resorption. Such case, you know, <clears throat> we are facing, it's uh, not very rare, but we are facing such cases a lot. <clears throat> The other thing is the benefit of romosozumab is it's not only a bone builder, but also has anti-resorptive anti effects. The problem is uh, if there is coupled, you know, bone formation and bone resorption, if you suppress bone formation, you usually suppress uh, bone resorption and vice versa. If you give anti-osteoporotic, anti-resorptive therapies, you suppress, you know, the bone resorption, but also you decrease a little bit the bone formation. But uh, uh, you know, romosozumab has dual benefit. So it acts as both as osteobuilder and anti-resorptive at the same time. So I, you know, I think this would be the best option in this case. Would you agree, Dr. Basser? Agree, for sure. Romosozumab is the best option in this case. Very good. Is it available? Many, many in other the, I'm sorry, is, is it available in, in Egypt, Jordan, and in the uh, Middle East countries or not? Yes, it is available in uh, the Gulf countries and Jordan, not yet, but uh, we have it from Saudi Arabia. So I have uh, at least uh, now uh, over 20 patients, special patients. It's not easy, but I think it's in registration. In Jordan now, they delay registration uh, of any medication. But I think we have it early 24. Very good, very good. Okay. Thank you so much. I think now we are all excited to see uh, Dr. Shaima Shabka uh, answers for the quiz. And till she will share her screen, I think, Dr. Basil, if you want to uh, manage uh, any <coughs> chat uh, box questions, we can have it in a minute. Somebody is asking, I think yeah. uh, Abdel Hamid is asking, can we extend the Romo for more than a year? Okay, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, no, but there are some studies about having another course for another year later on, but not yet licensed. He's only licensed it for one year. Thank you so much. Please go ahead, Dr. Scheinman. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your uh, participation. Uh, now I will share with you the right answers. Uh, 
Uh, for question number one, Prax uh, is a tool to estimate the risk of fractures using osteoporosis risk factors. Which of the following is considered an osteoporosis risk factor but not included in the Prax? And we have only 26% uh, of correct answers. Uh, the correct answer is uh, C, chronic kidney disease. Which uh, number two? Prax plus was Isn't developed... too sad? Dr. Yasser, why are you ignoring us? Why is a prax, you know, ignore patient with the uh, chronic kidney disease despite it's very uh, prevalent problem and uh, actually it can affect the bone health uh, uh, quite well? The problem is the nature of the bone health status in chronic kidney disease. You cannot have one standard. So you can have high bone turnover, low bone turnover, every one of them. Although in spite of that, we assess to consider the other risk factors. And then you will go to assess your patient with a chronic kidney disease and you deal with it. However, you can tick also the, chronic, the secondary osteoporosis box. However, the secondary osteoporosis box, if you are including the BMD, it will be nothing. So it is, count <coughs> it is counted if you haven't entered your BMD. Not counted as much in the calculation, uh, if you have entered the BMD, because they consider that the second osteoporosis disease will impact on the BMD state. Okay, I just want to make sure that you are not discriminating us or our patients. No, no, you are you are making problems for us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Go yes. ahead, uh, Dr. Shaima. Okay, uh, for uh, question two, uh, Frex Plus was developed to overcome the limitations of Frex. Among the modifications of Rex was the incorporation of an additional comorbidity. It is, and uh, only 12% uh, answered the correct answer. The correct answer is E, type 2 diabetes mellitus. Question number three, regarding the BMD measurement, which statement is correct? We have about 60% of correct answers. Uh, the correct answer is the C, osteophytes and the vascular calcifications may interfere with BMD measurements by DEXA scan. Question number four. All of the following statements regarding secondary osteoporosis due to rheumatoid arthritis are correct except we have 35% of correct answers. The correct answer is C, hip fractures are the most frequent type of osteoporotic fractures. Which it number would be five? disaster if, if hip fracture is the most common fracture in osteoporotic patients would be disaster because the mortality rate is very high. In general population, uh, about 20 to 25%, they die within a year after they fracture their hip. In CKD patients, 50 to 60% of dialysis patients who fractured their hip, they die within a year. So thanks God that it's uh, you know not uh, the commonest uh, form of osteoporotic fracture. Yes, uh, question number five. All of the following statements are true regarding the bone turnover markers except, and we have 25% of correct answers. The correct answer is D. Bone turnover markers are widely used for diagnosis of osteoporosis. I think uh, uh, the Professor Medani and uh, Professor Masri, they already highlighted this. Uh, they stopped using it. Uh, for <coughs> nephrology, it's a different story because um, we don't have clue and vision can have, you know, either very low bone turnover or high turnover. So, uh, and the BTH doesn't give the whole story, so we use it. It's only helpful if it is very high or very low. But uh, uh, unfortunately, the majority uh, of cases will have borderline, so that uh, the BTMs cannot uh, uh, be very helpful in this situation. And sometimes we need to do bone biopsy to make sure uh, that we are treating, uh, you know, either uh, turnover problem, mineralization problem, or problem with uh, uh, bone volume. Yes. Uh, but I think this question is talking about uh, Which number six? the management. So if it is the management, I think it would be uh, okay, it would be right. Okay, uh, question number six, which one of the following drugs used 
uh, which one of the following drugs used to treat osteoporosis is primarily ascleroostin inhibitor. And we have 48% uh, of correct answers. The correct answer is the D, bumuzuzumab. Question number seven. Uh, the cutoff T-score for diagnosing osteoporosis in patients receiving glucocorticoid is, we have about 46% uh, of correct answers. The correct answer is B. It's uh, uh, minus 1.5. The last question, several medications administ <laughs> administered in autoimmune and rheumatic disorders could lead to decreased BMD. All of the following can lead to this disorder except, and we have about 37% uh, of correct answers. The correct answer is C, etanercept. And thank you for your uh, participation. Thank you so much, you, uh, Dr. Shaima. <clears throat> I really appreciate uh, everyone contribution. We kept you very late tonight. I'm very sorry for that. Hopefully in the next uh, webinars, we'll make it at least an hour or two earlier. Um, and I really uh, like to see you, know, you staying with us for two hours. Thank you so much, everyone. I really also would like to uh, say thank you to Dr. Saeed Hamis, who is uh, the chief of the nephrology uh, division at Minofaya uh, University, and he is always with us, supporting us, and uh, um, you know, attending our meetings and adding uh, a lot to our meetings. So thank you so much, Dr. Said. You're welcome. You're welcome, dear bro. Mm -hmm. I, I think here we need uh, to uh, uh, close our session tonight. Again, uh, thank you, Professor Yasser Medani. Uh, you know, great contribution, great ideas and thoughts as usual. Dr. Basil Masri, I can't uh, thank you enough. Uh, your uh, participation and collaboration with us is unprecedented. I like I like also to uh, congratulate uh, Muhammad uh, Mabdoha Abdelbari, the main organizer of the meeting, and Ala Sawi, Rasha, and uh, Shaima, and uh, uh, everyone else who worked behind the scene uh, for the success of this webinar. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you uh, next month. Uh, we are planning to have monthly webinar. The World Kidney Academy is very excited to see you. And uh, I, I saw some question regarding the recording the webinar. Yes, it will be on the World Kidney Academy page, and we'll also share it with all the attendees today. We'll share the link, so don't worry about it. You will get it, and probably Mamdouh is going to share it on Facebook and YouTube and other um, uh, social media platforms as well. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.